we don't have a lot of time here, but I want to quickly reiterate um, basically what Dan said. I've talked all over the country, the native plant societies, and you know, lots of different groups, uh, but you guys are the biggest, the most accomplished uh, native plant society probably in the world. Um, so you should, yeah, you should, you should be proud. Okay. I want to talk about restoring uh, nature's relationships, and of course we need native plants to do that. Uh, but let's, let's start by talking about what some of these relationships are. This is the resplendent quetzal. It's, a, it's an endangered species in the forests of Central America, and it's endangered for one primary reason, it has a very specialized diet. If you don't have fruits of the, the wild avocado tree, you don't have these beautiful birds. Of course, we've cut down most of the wild avocado trees, but we want these birds in our future, so we, we figured out we can actually plant them again. The little tree at the, the knees of those uh, young ladies there is an avocado tree. Fortunately, it grows pretty quickly. It reaches the, the age at which it, re it makes those fruits in not too many years. And it's actually starting to look better for the, the future of that beautiful bird. But this uh, conservation scenario is repeated time and time again. If you want to save jaguars, you have to have particular species of palm trees. Why palm trees? Because they make palm nuts. And palm nuts happen to be the favorite food of peccaries which is the favorite food of jaguars. So we're talking about specialization in the natural world, particularly focused on, on food webs as being the rule. It's not the exception, and it always starts with plants. Now, a lot of people think you get all this specialization in the tropical areas of the world because there is so much specialization in the tropical areas of the world. Um, but we actually have a lot of specialization in the, the temperate zone, and some of the most specialized relationships that have ever evolved anywhere occur right in our yards. And this is one of them. This is a female bola spider hanging from a river birch leaf in my yard. It's obvious why she's called a bola spider. She doesn't spin a web. She just drops a single strand of silk, puts one sticky glob of glue at the, the base of that, that silk. Now she doesn't swing it around her head like a, a bola. <laughs> but it looks like she goes fishing with it. She lowers it and raises it and lowers it real slowly. And the first time I watched her do that, I told her, you're not gonna catch anything because I could not imagine something flying into that single target. It seemed to me a web would be a much better way to go. But about 15 seconds later, a moth flew in and got stuck on her glob of glue and she reeled it in. She manipulated it for quite some time and actually turned it into a fancy egg mass. Um, well, what I didn't know at the time is that that was not an accident. That spider was releasing the sex pheromone of that particular species of moth. So that guy's a male, he thought she was a female she was, but the wrong species. <laughs> and that was the end of him. And it turns out that every species of bola spider in the world mimics the sex pheromone of one species of moth. So you can have bola spiders in your yard if you have the plant that supports the larval development of the moth that your bola spider is mimicking the sex pheromone of. Very specialized relationship. Now back east we have a Phlox de Barricado. I'm sure you've got phlox here in the west. Uh, and it's a, it's a favorite garden plant, spreads readily from seed, but only if it's pollinated. And if you look at the entrance to the corolla of those flocks, it's very narrow. Watch native bees land on those flowers, try to get their tongues in there, and they can't do it. So who's pollinating our flocks? Well, it turns out it's day-flying sphinx moths, like this hummingbird sphinx or this snowberry clear wing. They have very long tongues, which they sink deep into the corolla of those flowers, and the tongues are the right width. They might have something sticky on them, I don't know, but when they pull, pull them out, they're loaded with pollen. Then they fly to the next flower, and, and you get pollination. Uh, so you can have uh, flocks that make lots of seed if you have adult snowberry clear wings, and you can have adult snowberry clear wings if you have larval snowberry clear wings, and you can have larval snowberry clear wings if you have coral honeysuckle, which is their native host. That's the native honeysuckle. Even animals we don't think of as having specialized relationship with plants often do, at least at one part of their life cycle. I'm gonna use the Carolina chickadee as an example. Uh, now, a lot of people uh, recognize chickadees as seed eaters because that's what they, they see at their, uh, their feeder most of the winter. Uh, and about half of a chickadee's diet in the wintertime is seed. Uh, the rest is, is insects. But when chickadees are reproducing, they're not eating seeds anymore, and their offspring, their young, can't eat seeds. So they become insect specialists, and not just insects, but caterpillar specialists. And if they're in a healthy environment, um, they will feed their young almost exclusively on caterpillars. 
And it turns out that uh, they're not exceptions. Most of our terrestrial bird species are rearing their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. So let's talk about why they're choosing caterpillars. We have a lot of other insects out there, but um, gotta figure out why caterpillars are favored. Now I thought about this, and I think maybe it's because they're beautiful. We got some beautiful caterpillars out there, like the Pandora Sphinx, the Coletta Silk Moth, Spiny Rose Caterpillar, the Black Spotted Prominent, the uh, Curve Line Angle, that's one of my favorites, the Fawn Sphinx, I think that's art in the garden right there. This common black swallowtail, very beautiful, the purple crested slug, the major day tana, the hieroglyphic moth, the spun glass caterpillar, all very beautiful. I think the birds like that. <laughs> or it could be that they have cool names, like the, the green marvel, the once charred punky, <laughs> the confused wood grain, the cynical ground cat, the neighbor, the Donald, Could be. Well, well and I know what some of you were thinking. It's not your caterpillar, I know. <laughs> Actually, I don't really think it's because they have cool names or because they're beautiful. I think there's some very practical reasons why these birds are favoring caterpillars. And one of them is that uh, most of them are soft. And that means if you're a bird, you can stuff them down the throat of your, your baby without fear of injuring the, the, uh, the offspring. They, and that's what they do. They get their beaks and they use it like a plunger and stuff it right down. So that's, that's important. They're also relatively large prey. Uh, now, one medium-sized caterpillar equals the biomass of 200 aphids. Now, some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or do you want to get one caterpillar? Oh, let's go back for a second here. They're also very nutritious. They're, they're high in fats, they're high in proteins. They have a very low percentage of chitin, of exoskeleton, which is undigestible. Uh, and that separates them from most beetles. Beetles are very well protected. They have a lot of exoskeleton, um, so, and that's the, none of that can be digested. And they're the best source of carotenoids for birds when they're reproducing. So we need to talk about carotenoids for a few minutes because they're essential components of vertebrate diets, except we vertebrates, don't make them, we can't make them, we have to get them from plants. And that's why my, my wife, uh, Cindy, tells me I have to eat my carrots to get my beta carotene, I have to eat my, my tomatoes to get my lycopene, my whatever that is in the corner there to get my lutein. Uh, and she makes sure I get all of that because these carotenoids stimulate my immune system. Notice, I don't have the flu yet. <laughs> and it's because I have lots of, lots of uh, uh, carotenoids. But they're also antioxidants. They run around my, my uh, uh, well, they run around our bodies and they protect our, our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you will see better. It turns out she was right. She didn't know she was right, but, but she was right. They improve sperm vitality. Who doesn't need that? They improve sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about uh, male birds in particular that are taking the carotenoids, or uh, the, yeah, the carotenoids and putting them in the pigments that make up their colorful feathers. So that's a, a prothonotary warbler male. He's bright yellows because he's had access to lots of, of lutines. And of course, the brighter he is, uh, the more ladies he attracts. So those are all reasons why we and birds need carotenoids. Okay, back to chickadees. They're vertebrates. They can't make their own carotenoids, so they, they've got to get them from plants, but they're not eating plants when they're reproducing, so they have to get them from something that did eat plants. Uh, and, and yes, that's something as insects, but this is the key. Uh, the bar to the, to all the way to the right is, is that right, to the, to the left? I don't know. The big bar is, those are caterpillars. They have twice as many carotenoids as other types of insects, and three times as many carotenoids as spiders. And spiders are important components of bird uh, diets as well. So we're not sure why that, that is, uh, but that makes caterpillars essential components of bird diets, not just optional components. They, they really do need them. Um, and that means a bird or chickadee is not going to be able to reproduce in an environment if uh, it doesn't have enough caterpillars. So now we need to know what enough caterpillar is. How many caterpillars does it take to make a clutch of chickadees? Uh, well, uh, several years ago, I, I just want to know what chickadees ate, so I put a little chickadee box up in my yard and, and I hung it low so I could set my camera up and take pictures of what they were bringing in. That's when I saw they were bringing in caterpillars. But I also saw they were bringing them in very quickly. Both the male and the female are out there foraging all the time, and they can bring a caterpillar into the nest once every three minutes. 
I was impressed with that. I look for caterpillars in my yard all the time, and it, I don't find them once every three minutes. Um, in one 27-minute period, they brought back 30 different caterpillars. How do they do that? By bringing back more than one at a time, and sometimes a whole bunch. And they're doing this all day long, 6 a.m. to about 8 p.m., so they're working very, very hard. Well, the next question we have to ask is, how many species of caterpillars do they bring back? Uh, and it turns out this is a very important question. I was watching them for three hours, and during that three hours, they brought back 17 species of caterpillars. Now, keep in mind, chickadees and most birds do not forage very far from the nest. They don't fly five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. Um, they're foraging about 50 meters from the nest, so if you want breeding birds in your yard, you need to have caterpillars in your yard. Um, so I watched them for three hours and got 17 species. That is important because if I had one or two species of caterpillars in my yard and it happened to be a bad year for those species, the chickadees would not be able to reproduce. But if I have 17 species or 34 species or 134 species and I've actually been counting them recently, uh, I'm up to 736 species of caterpillars in my yard. Uh, well, then there'll always be some combination of those species, even if it's a bad year, even if you've had terrible cold rains or something, there'll be some combination of those species that will make them common enough so that the birds will be able to reproduce every year. Uh, and that's important. This is diversity creating stability in your food web, or diversity creating stability in your ecosystem. This is why we want a diversity of the native plants that produce these caterpillars. There's a guy by the name of Richard Brewer, way back in 1961, decided he would count all the caterpillars that chickadees brought into their nests. Um, I don't know why he wanted to do that, but I'm glad he did. It turned out to be between 390 and 570 caterpillars every day, depending on the number of chicks in the nest. And the chickadees reared their young on average for 16 days before the, the young fledge. After they fledge, the parents continued to feed them caterpillars for another 30 days, but they're flying all over the place, so old Brewer couldn't count them. So just until they, they fledge, that's 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars required to make one clutch of chickadees. And chickadees are tiny birds, a third of an ounce. That's four pennies worth of bird. What if I wanted to have red belly woodpeckers in my yard that are eight times heavier? How many caterpillars does that take? And of course, I don't want just red belly woodpeckers and chickadees. I want a diversity of birds that at least used to be common. I want our, our scarlet tanager, and I want our titmouse, and our blue jays, and our bluebirds, and our tree swallows, and our common yellow throats, and indigo bunnings, and towhees, and yellow warblers, and thrushes, and house wrens, and cardinals, and hummingbirds, all birds that used to be common in our neighborhoods, at least back east. And I don't want one pair of them. I want breeding populations of these things. Can you imagine the number of caterpillars it takes to have that, that type of bird community? I can't, and I've been thinking about this a lot. Now, you might be saying, well, you don't need insects for hummingbirds because they eat sugar water. And they do eat sugar water, uh, but they eat sugar water after they've had those insects and spiders. 80 to 90% of a hummingbird's diet is insects and spiders, and then they go get the sugar water. And that is true for 96% of the terrestrial birds in North America. They are rearing their young directly or indirectly on insect protein. And when I say indirectly, I mean if they ate a spider, remember the spider needed an insect to become a spider. So we have birds in our lives because of insect protein. Uh, and of course, if we get rid of that insect protein, we're gonna get, get rid of our birds and many other things. No insects, no baby birds. All right, so we've got to make insects, we've got to make caterpillars in our yards. How do we do that? What types of landscapes are capable of producing the, the diversity and abundance of insects that we're talking about here? Well, now we have to go back and talk about specialized relationships again. We need to consider the most common type of specialized relationships that have evolved anywhere all over the planet, and that's the relationship between the insects that eat plants and the plants themselves. So I'm not talking about pollinators here, I'm talking about that polyphemus moth and the oak leaf that it's eating. Remember, plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And if you don't believe me, next time you're outside, eat a leaf, see if you like it. You won't like it. It's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. Uh, but of course, we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? 
Uh, well, this is where the specialization comes in. About 90% of the insects that eat plants are what we call host plant specialists. They choose one or two plant lineages that share a common cocktail of chemical defenses, and they develop the adaptations required to get around those chemical defenses. They develop the enzymes, the behavioral adaptations, the life history adaptations that allow them to eat those plants without dying. But it takes a long period of evolutionary exposure to those lineages for all those adaptations to fall into place. It does not happen overnight. Now let's use the monarch butterfly as an example. Uh, I'm gonna use that example because you already know half the story of, of the monarchs. You know that they are specialists on milkweeds. Now there's nothing special about their specialized relationship with milkweeds. That's what 90% of all the insects are doing. They specialize on one lineage of plant. Um, but milkweeds, of course, are toxic plants. When you're outside eating plants, don't eat a milkweed because it's got cardiac glycosides in it. And if you eat enough of the milkweed, it'll stop your heart. That's what cardiac glycosides do. Uh, well, it doesn't stop the monarch's heart, and they do have a heart, by the way, because they've got those, those physiological adaptations that allow them to eat cardiac glycosides without dying. And that's part of the story. The other part of the story is what they're doing with the sticky latex sap that happens to be in milkweeds. It gives milkweeds its common name. When you break open the vein, a vein of a milkweed leaf, uh, you get this white goo that comes out. Uh, and if you get it on your finger, usually we wipe it off right away, but if you don't, just let it sit there, it'll gel, it'll become like chewing gum. And that is the defensive property of that latex sap. If a caterpillar crawls onto a milkweed leaf and starts eating it and gets it on its mandibles, it glues its mouth shut. And then of course it starves to death. Very effective defense. So how do monarch Caterpillars eat milkweeds without getting their mouth parts glued. Well, they first walk onto a leaf. Usually they go down to the end of the leaf and they start eating. And if any latex sap starts to ooze out at all, um, they will stop eating immediately. They'll turn around, crawl back up the leaf about two thirds of the way, and then they start to chew through the midrib. They chew right through the midrib, blocking the canals that shunt the latex sap down to the terminal edge of the leaf. Then they can turn around and go back down and eat that leaf without any latex sap coming out. This is a behavioral adaptation that allows them to uh, get around another type of, of milkweed defense. Of course, that flags the leaf. And this, if you're a monarch hunter, this allows you to drive down the road and look at a milkweed patch and determine whether there are any monarchs in it just by looking for those flag leaves. Okay, those are the upsides of, of specialization. Um, now a monarch can eat a, a plant that's really unavailable to most other insects. The downsides of specialization is that now that's all it can eat. So by developing all those specialized adaptations to get around milkweed defenses, they have not spent any evolutionary time developing the adaptations to get around the tannins that are in oaks or the cucurbitations in cucurbits or the cyanide in, in uh, cherries or the nicotine in tobacco and, and on and on. And what that means is if they can only eat milkweeds and we take the milkweeds away, monarchs start to disappear. And that, of course, is what's, what's happening both west of the Rockies and east of the Rockies. Monarchs are, are in big trouble, largely, not solely, but largely because we haven't shared our landscapes very well with milkweeds. We've never shared our residential neighborhoods well with milkweeds. We haven't thought about it, but the agriculture used to pick up the slack. But now we have, uh, we have different agricultural ethics. We have grass along the sides of our fields. We have Roundup Ready corn and soybean, get rid of all the weeds. We have a marketing issue with native plants. We shouldn't call them weeds, first of all. Um, we should call milkweeds monarchs delight, and then it would be okay to plant them. But anyway, monarchs have declined about 96% from their population levels in 1976. I don't want you to think it's just moths and butterflies that are specialists. This is the elderberry beetle. It only eats elderberry. The dogbane beetle only eats dogbane. Sumac flea beetle only eats sumac. This is a Korean bug that only eats ash. Of course, we've got the emerald ash borer in, in, uh, in the east, and it's killing all of our ashes. If it succeeds, we will lose this insect. Uh, Dave Wagner at the University of Connecticut has looked at the ash specialists. Uh, it's about 95 species that will disappear if we lose our ashes. And of course, that is the problem, the fact that so many of our insects are host plant specialists. If you take away the plants on which they have specialized, they will disappear. Um, there is some good news in all of this, though. As we learn more and more about um, the components of different food webs, it actually gives us the tools to be able to reestablish those food webs wherever we want to do it. So let's talk about doing it in, in our yard. 
We're gonna use this knowledge of specialization to build food webs. And I'm gonna use the white-eyed vireo as an example, because that is a nest that, that my wife Cindy found in, in our yard uh, a few years ago. Now the birds knew that I had to take pictures of the caterpillars they were bringing back to the nest so that I could identify them. And if we knew which caterpillar species they were, we know a lot about what they eat. Then we know what plant was necessary to support the babies of the white-eyed vireo. So they built their nest very low. And I could set my camera up again. Um, so let's do that. Let's, let's track what they're bringing back to the nest and see what produced them. That is the blinded sphinx moth. It is a specialist on black cherry. Now in our yard, we have, we have lots of black cherry, uh, making those caterpillars so the babies get to eat. This is the chestnut caesura, and despite its common name, it's a specialist on native viburnums. Uh, now in our, our yard, that's viburnum dentatum, arrowwood. We know that because that's the one we planted. Our yard was mowed for hay. Uh, before we moved in. So uh, the, we know pretty much the plants that are there because they're the ones we have put in. So uh, viburnum dentatum, making chestnut chisura as the babies get to eat again. This little guy with a white stripe is called the drab prominent. It's a specialist on sycamores. Now we did not plant sycamores in our yard, uh, but uh, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago or so, there was a big wind and it blew in some sycamore seeds from someplace and one landed in my cold frame and it germinated and I'm not very fast at weeding things out. It's now well over 40 feet tall. <laughs> but it's making drab prominence so the babies get to eat again. So let's go uh, on and on. This is the eight-spotted forester moth, the specialist on native grapes. We have lots of those. Excuse me. This is the lunate zelly, another specialist on black cherry. This is the spicebush swallowtail. If you can see its phony eye up there and its prothorax, it's supposed to scare the bird into thinking it's a, uh, a tree snake but it didn't work this time. Um, it's a specialist on spice bush and its close relative sassafras. We have both of those. This is the tufted bird dropping moth, another specialist on black cherry. So black cherry is emerging as a really important component of, of this bird's food web. Uh, but these guys are hungry. They need a lot more than that. So let's put some, some uh, black walnut in the landscape. If we do that, we get the walnut sphinx, the gray edged boma loco, the black blotch caesura, the bride, all specialists on black walnut where I come from. Native maples will give us Plagodes inchworms, green striped maple worm, the maple bantam dagger moth, and of course many others. Native elms, the four horn sphinx, the double toothed prominent, the interrupted dagger moth, and again many others. Remember, 90% of the insects we need to feed these white eyed vireos will not be in our yard unless we have the plants that make those insects. So if we want the mustard sallow, we need witch hazel. If we want the hackberry emperor, we need hackberry. If you want Coculio asteroides, we need native asters. The Arcedura flower moth and brown hooded owlet need goldenrod. The hog sphinx, Pandora sphinx, abbot sphinx all need Virginia creeper. Red bud leaf roller needs red bud. The gray furcula needs native willows. The turbulent phosphilla needs greenbrier. And the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the delightful dagger moth, the pleasant dagger moth, the, uh, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, <laughs> the white blotch heterocampa, the red line, or the, the, yeah, the red, no, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, and the laffer. And of course, many, many more won't be there if you don't have oaks. Where I come from, and in 83% of the counties of this country, oak is number one in producing the caterpillars that, that we need. By the way, you know where I took all these pictures? My front yard. I took them in my front yard. I don't like the term backyard habitat because it implies everything we want to do with native plants is so ugly, we have to hide it in the backyard. Not true, not true. We can put them in the front yard too. Uh, it also cuts our conservation area in half. What is wrong with the front yard? It's okay. Why do we want all these insects? We talked about birds. The birds need the insects. We want our birds. But they're just indicators. Insects are critical components of almost all the terrestrial food webs that we have out there. Let's go back to spiders. All spiders are eating insects, or they're eating other spiders that ate insects. So you get rid of the insects, you get rid of spiders. And some people are happy to do that. They say, I don't like spiders. But look who does. It's the second most important component of bird food webs. So again, if you like birds, you're clobbering them if you get rid of your spiders. You're also getting rid of really important predators that are keeping the things, the insects we don't want too many of, like mosquitoes and other things, down. 
We have a lot of insect predators that are eating the insect herbivores. If we get rid of the herbivores, we get rid of the predators, and they themselves are important components of food webs. If we lose our insects, we lose our frogs, we lose our toads, we lose all of the amphibians because they all eat insects. So do our lizards, so do our bats, so do our rodents, believe it or not. Everybody thinks of rodents as eating seeds, and of course they do, uh, but only when they can't find enough insects. And the reason they want insects is that they're really good food. Pound for pound, there's twice as much protein in insect meat as there is in beef, and they have uh, organs in their abdomen called fat bodies that are loaded with lipids, high energy compounds that allow those little guys to, to grow quickly and reproduce quickly, and if you're a mouse, that's what you want to do because there's a lot of things that want to eat you. But same reason that larger organisms are, are uh, eating insects, they're just really good food. The skunk is digging up your yard to get the, the grubs that are in your yard. Possums eat a lot of insects. Raccoons eat a lot of insects. And even things we don't think of as insectivores eat a lot of insects. Uh, like our friend, the, the red fox here. 25% of a red fox's diet is insects, a full quarter of its diet. 23% of a black bear's diet is insects. Doesn't matter how big you are, you need insects. And even if you don't eat insects, you need insects. This is a shark shin hawk, it's a bird predator. And you might think I can get rid of all the insects in my neighborhood and still have uh, sharp shin hawks, but think about it. The birds this guy's eating need insects to become birds. So he needs the insects indirectly, so does the garter snake. It's not eating insects directly, but it's eating the frogs and toads that ate the insects. A world without insects is a world without biological diversity. And E.O. Wilson told us decades ago that a world without biological diversity is a world without humans. And that's why this is an important message, certainly to you people, but to everybody on the planet. Everybody in Manhattan, everybody in Beijing. Nobody is going to be able to live without biological diversity, so we need to think about how we're going to save it. Starting with those insects. We are losing our insects. There's recent uh, research coming largely out of Europe telling us uh, how much trouble our insects are in. 30% of Europe's orthopterans, the grasshoppers, the katydids, the crickets, are now at risk of extinction. Uh, what, 5.3 fold of the, the uh, insects in Germany have, have disappeared or declined since 1989. 46 species of moths and butterflies now gone from, from uh, Germany. Uh, and, and here's the, the kicker, invertebrate abundance, and that is largely insects, has declined 45% since, what, 1974. Now, E.O. Wilson has also told us insects are the little things that run the world. We just lost half of them. This is not good. This is not good. And of course, if we lose insects, we lose the things that eat those insects. And again, in most cases, we are not measuring what they are, but we do measure what birds are doing, because we like birds. We've got the State of the Birds report. 2016, 432 birds in North America at risk of extinction. That's a third of our birds at risk of extinction. There are now 1.5 billion fewer birds breeding in North America today than there were just 45, 40 years ago. And remember, a billion is a thousand million. That's a lot of birds we're not seeing anymore. And if we don't see them long enough, we don't even miss them because we forget that they were ever there. 46 species lost half their, their population. Um, so our birds are in trouble because their ecosystems are not happy. And of course, those are the same ecosystems that support us. It's another message. The birds truly are the canaries in, in the, uh, in the what? The mine, the mine shaft, yeah, whatever they're in. Um, it's not good news, folks. It's not good, good news. Uh, so we need to figure out what's going wrong and we need, we need to fix it. We have parks, we have preserves. And part of their mandate is to maintain the biodiversity that, that we need. They're not doing the job, so what is, what is wrong? Uh, there's a few things that are wrong, but the most important thing is that our parks and preserves are too small. They're too small. They're too small all over the planet. When you take a large area like this and you shrink it down to a little fragment of its former self, and this is an exaggeration. I was in a helicopter and that happened to be the little woodlot we flew over, but that's, that's what it looks like in the east. You're taking large populations and shrinking them down to small populations. And that's the problem. Small populations are highly vulnerable to local extinction. Why is that? Because all populations fluctuate. In good times, they go up. Bad times, they go down. If you look at the top line, that's a large population. Even in its down cycle, there's enough individuals so it can increase quickly when times get better. But the bottom line there is a tiny population, and in its natural fluctuations, it typically hits zero and blinks out of its little habitat fragment. And unless 
that organism can re recolonize that fragment and picture a, a, a box turtle crossing a major highway, it's not gonna happen, then it's permanently extinct. That's called local extinction. Uh, and studies all over the world, some of them quite lengthy, 100 years in length, are telling us the same thing. The natural areas we've left on this planet are not large enough to sustain the life we need them to sustain. That's a lot of bad news. And I, I realize people have a bad news cup, and when it gets filled up, they kind of turn off. They don't listen anymore. Bad news. You might have come in here today with your bad news cup filled up. If you watched the news this morning, I don't know. But I have to talk about one more piece of bad news, and then we'll talk about some good news. Not only have we fragmented the natural world and uh, isolated habitat fragments, um, but we've also created this thing we call invasive species, and we can just talk about invasive plants. We now have more than 3,300 species of plants from someplace else, non-native plants, and they're defined as invasive because they're aggressively displacing native plant communities. Uh, so the consequences of that is what we've been studying in my lab for, uh, I don't know, the last 12 years or so, this is one of the habitat fragments I'm talking about. This is White Clay Creek State Park. I drive by it on the way to work when I uh, go to work in the University of Delaware. There's a period in the spring in the east when plants from Asia leaf out before plants from North America, and that's what you're looking at there. Every bit of green you see in White Clay Creek State Park here in March uh, is from, from China. And it's all of our favorites, multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and privet and burning bush and calorie pear and Norway maple and ailanthus and miscanthus and on and on and on. They're all escapees from our gardens. So now more than a third of the vegetation and most of the natural areas around the country are from someplace else, which means they haven't been here long enough to establish the specialized relationships that create the insects that allow everything else to live. Um, so we've been measuring. Uh, we, we like to put numbers on things. Instead of just talking, we try to measure things so we can see exactly what the impact on food webs is when we replace native plant communities with, with plants from someplace else. And we have a number of papers that, that uh, outline our results. Um, we didn't try to, but we've actually made it easy for you because we always get the same answer. So you only read one, you've read them all. But you know what? I know you're not gonna read any of them, so let's talk about <laughs> Let's talk about an experiment you can do at home. Um, I call this my 12 by 12 experiment. This is 12 feet by 12 feet staked out. So I've staked it out over a period of a bit of lawn here. You get to determine how much life is gonna be in that 12 by 12 section by determining which plants are there and how many are there. You can keep it as lawn. You can get on your hands and knees on, on Wednesday and count all the biodiversity in, in that space. Won't take you long. And then of course on Saturday you mow it and you kill it, kill it all or we could put a tree in there. Let's put, this is a white oak that I planted from an, an acorn 14 years before I took that picture, which proves oaks grow. I've heard, I've heard uh, landscapers tell people, don't plant an oak, you won't live long enough to enjoy it. I'm enjoying it. It doesn't have to be 300 years old before, before you enjoy it. Okay, let's walk around the, the base of that tree, just at head height and count the caterpillars on the lower branches of that, that tree. It's filling that 12 by 12 section very nicely. And let's do it on, on July 25th of 2014. We're gonna find 410 caterpillars from 19 different species. And then I'm gonna stand back and take that picture so I can ask you, how many of those caterpillars do you see? How much caterpillar damage do you see? None. And this is the distance at which we typically view our trees. But if I knocked on your door and said, you got 410 caterpillars on your, your oak tree, ah, get the spray can, save the tree. You don't have to save the tree. Let me just, one caveat here. I'm not talking about non-native insects. These are all native insects. We're not gonna tolerate non-native insects, but these are natives. It's a normal interaction. The oak is sharing part of its energy with those caterpillars, which will soon be in the belly of a bird or something else. This is a normal interaction and we don't have to interfere and save the tree. I met a woman named uh, Tammany Baumgarten in New Orleans this year who suggests we all practice the 10 step program. Take 10 steps back from your tree and all of your insect problems disappear. <laughs> so I like that. Okay, now we're gonna go to a black cherry and we're gonna, it's, it's filling our 12 by 12 section, count the caterpillars on the lower branches 239 caterpillars from 14 different species. Now we're gonna to go to my neighbor's house. 
Uh, my neighbor moved in the same month we did. He's got the same amount of property. He had very different plant choices. He really liked calorie pear. You might know it as Bradford pear. Uh, it's a highly invasive species from, from Asia. So we planted 32 of them. So the first thing we have to do is decide which calorie pear we're gonna, we're gonna measure. Actually, the first thing we have to do is make sure he's not home. <laughs> All right, let's measure that one. Walk around 12 by 12, count the caterpillars. I did find a caterpillar, one little geometrid from one species. Um, and then I went to his burning bush, another highly invasive ornamental plant from, from Asia. 12 by 12 section, count the caterpillars. I got four little leaf skeletonizers from one species, and they're too small to be part of a local food web. Well, you know, in, in uh, science, you replicate. We just got a pattern, but is it real, or was it by chance? Well, let's do it again. We should do it a number of times to see whether it's real. So the next day, we'll do the same thing, same species, but different plants. We get the same pattern. We get different numbers, but the same pattern. 233 caterpillars on the white oak, 53 in the black cherry, two in the burning bush, one on the calorie pear. And that is the pattern you're going to see no matter how many times you compare non-native plants with native plants in their ability to support food webs. We have some particularly productive genera of native plants producing most of the food, and these plants from Asia um, are unable to do that. They're not evil plants. They just haven't been here long enough to be able to participate in our ecosystems. And you might say, well, how long is long? They've been here 100 years. They have, but we've measured some plants that have been here 400 years, and they still have just a tiny fraction of the life that they have from where they, they come from. So we're, we're looking at thousands of years, probably tens of thousands of years, to establish the relationships that these plants need to have. And in the meantime, they're forcing things to extinction. Uh, Rick Dark and I talked in Williamsburg, Virginia, not this spring, but the spring before that, and after the talk, we drove up the eastern shore of Maryland, if anybody knows the east coast, crossed the Bay Bridge on our way home, and we got to the Sunset Beach Inn and Grill, which is the first uh, structure you come to, and there are all the calorie pears in full bloom, and that's why people plant them. It's uh, you know, it a nice, nice white bloom in the spring, pretty good fall color. The real reason they plant them is it's the cheapest tree on the market. Uh, it doesn't live very long. You get the ice storm, and it comes down uh, as soon as soon as that happens, but a lot of people like calorie pear. All right, we kept driving right past the Sunset Beach Inn and Grill, and the very next property was this one. It's owned by a land conservancy. I don't know how many acres it is, but you can see it is thoroughly invaded with the offspring from the plants at the, the Sunset Beach Inn and Grill. Uh, and this is, the, this is the horticultural ethical dilemma of our times. Most people would argue that the Sunset Beach Inn and Grill has the right to put any plant they want on their property. They've got personal property rights. But do they have the right to ecologically castrate, to biologically pollute all of the land around them? I know what I say about that. I can drive from, from New York City to Richmond, Virginia in the spring when calorie repairs in bloom. It is white all the way down, and nobody planted them. They're out there, and they're, this is a plant making one caterpillar, remember? Our little chickadees are not going to be able to breed in a situation like that. Uh, a uh, wildlife uh, manager in England recently said that land ownership is more than a privilege, it's a responsibility, uh, and I couldn't agree more. If we're going to own sections of the earth, we do not have the right, we certainly have the responsibility to support the life that used to be on those, those sections. And that's a new way of thinking. We used to think there was a lot of nature out there. There's not. Not anymore, we have to do it where, where we humans are. So how are we gonna do that? Which plants should we be sure to have in, in our landscapes? Well, we've been working on that in, in our lab as well too. Um, one of the things we, we do is make lists. This is the first list we made several years ago. It's a ranking of the woody plant genera in the mid-Atlantic states from the plants that support the most caterpillars to the ones that support the least. So memorize that. We did this for one particular reason, but right away we found out this was a, a, a popular list. People figured out if you plant the, the uh, now that we've identified the plants that are making the most food for our food webs, those are the ones we should have in our yards. But people from California say, where's our list? From, from uh, Wisconsin, where's our list? From Florida, where's our list? This is the mid-Atlantic states. Uh, well, we finally have, have produced a, a list. Uh, for every state in the union, it is now in the National Wildlife Federation website called Native Plant Finder. You put in your zip code and the ranked list for your county comes up wherever you are. And it works really well for every place except California. 
They will give you a rank list for your county, but you've got huge counties and fantastic geographical diversity in this state. So we're gonna to have to fine tune it a little bit more, but it's a good starting point, good starting point. Um, Audubon has a similar list, but it's built off of the, the rankings of the plants from the mid-Atlantic states, so it won't be too, too useful for you folks. One of the things I noticed when we were making this list is that there was a distinct pattern that showed up around the world, or around the, the country. It might be around the world, I don't know. And that is that um, there really are just a few plant genera producing most of the food. And I started calling those genera foraging hubs. Um, I have found out you people don't like that, that term. So we can call them keystone genera, hosts with the most, super plants, whatever you wanna call them. But my thinking uh, came from, from uh, an experience on a Delta plane once. We were sitting on the tarmac, not going anywhere. So I was looking at the Delta magazine and this, these are the Delta hubs. Uh, and I said, well, gee, that's, that's just what I'm talking about with, with foraging hubs. Let's make them foraging hubs. So there's circles there. That's a willow, a cherry, a pine, and an oak. The lower one is, is the oak. Notice all the lines going into it. Each one of those lines could be a bird. It could be a species of bird. It could be a lizard. Something going into that tree to get something to eat because that tree is making a lot of food. There are other black dots all over that map. And each one of them is a plant. And there are lines going into those plants as well, but not very many, because those plants aren't making very much food. So imagine what would happen if we took those, those keystone genera, those foraging hubs, excuse me, out of the landscape. You'd still have dozens of other plants, and they could be all native plants, but you'd have a failed food web, because the powerhouses are gone. And it turns out that 5% of our local native plant genera are producing about 75% of the food which means we're not going to be able to build successful food webs if we ignore those, those powerhouses. You can reverse that. You can build a, a, a landscape using 95 of the available local plant genera and only produce 25% of the food that you could have. That's a failed food web. Uh, so we do want to diversify. We want to get those plants in there, but you have to have those powerhouses as, as the backbone, as the structure of your, your landscape. Um, so back east, let's make a couple of, of uh, comparisons here. Um, oaks are number one, as I said earlier, 557 species of caterpillars on, on oaks. And again, if you don't like caterpillars, just say 557 species of bird food. And that's before you get to the acorns uh, on oaks. Now let's compare that with, how about ginkgo? Ginkgo biloba, you know, tree from Asia. Our, our lists say ginkgo support five species of caterpillars. But we've tracked down those records, um, and we believe they're all mistaken host records. And, and I can tell you why, it's, pretty, it's easier to get a, a mistaken record than you think. But as far as we can tell, nothing eats ginkgo. If you ever see something eating a ginkgo, take a picture of it and send it to me. I've been saying that for years, I have no, no pictures. Um, well, ginkgo, you know, it's a nice tree, but if you're trying to support the life around you, that's not, not the way to go. Number two on, on our list and lists all over the country are native prunus, so that black cherry and pin cherry and American plum, Chickasaw plum, 456 species of, of caterpillars on native prunus. Let's compare that with Zelkova, another very common street tree from Asia. Zero recorded on Zelkova. That's what they always look like. The leaves are always perfect. And if that is your goal in landscaping, to have a perfectly uh, non-interacting plant that always looks perfect, um, Zelkova is for you. But why don't you get a silk zocova or a plastic one, and then you can really help the water issues here because it's not gonna interact with anything that's, that's alive. Pyrus japonica used to be the most common foundation plant in North America. This illustrates an important point. We have native Pieris. It's a native genus, but it's not very productive. Only two species recorded from, from native Pieris. I don't think there's anything on, on uh, Pieris japonica but it could be a native viburnum that has 103 species. So our plant choices, the plants we put in our yards are determining how much life can, can live in those, those yards. If you go to that native plant finder and go back, um, plug in your, your zip code. Here are the top plants for uh, Los Angeles County. You will notice willows are number one. It's one of the few counties where oaks are number one, but oaks are number two here, followed by prunus, followed by cottonwood. I was in one of those uh, um, emerging pests workshops yesterday, uh, and the, your, your new beetle invasive species that are, are clobbering your plants, what are they hitting? Willows, oaks, uh, prunus, and cottonwood. So uh, this, is, this is bad, this is bad. But anyway, that's how your, your list will, will work. 
So think of the plants in your yard as if they are bird feeders. There you go, they're bird feeders. Now you get to determine how well you're gonna feed the birds. You can feed them a lot, or you can feed them just a little bit. This is what the landscapes around me look like. They're giant lawns with very few plants. Um, you can put food in your bird feeders. Remember, you're putting plants that make insects that the birds eat, or you can keep them empty. That big, big tree in the back there is a ginkgo. It's big, but it's not making any food. Uh, and when we landscape in a way that doesn't think about these, these keystone genera, these foraging hubs, we're not fooling the birds. I'm gonna share a little bit of data with you from my uh, PhD student, Desiree Narengo, who's been working with Carolina chickadees in the suburbs of, of Washington, DC. She's followed 93 pairs of chickadees uh, and looked at their breeding success in relation to the landscape in which they are breeding. Um, I hope you can see it. There's a red line there that outlines the uh, foraging territory of this particular pair. The star is where the nest is. Uh, so that foraging territory is about 50 meters from the nest. The blue shaded areas are the trees on which they did 95% of their foraging when they were rearing their young. Uh, and, and you will recognize these are all the native trees in this landscape. Basswood, sweet gum, American elm, black cherry, two species of, of oaks. Let's also look at the trees they're not foraging on. And those are all the trees from, from Asia. And they're not foraging on them because they, they don't have any food. So Japanese maples, and there's ginkgo, and saucer magnolia, crepe, crepe myrtles. And it's very easy to picture a landscape in which those are the dominant trees. And when that happens, this happens. This is a failed nest. And after Desiree took the three dead chicks out of the nest, she saw a bunch of sunflower seeds in the bottom of the nest. Remember, chickadees can't, baby chickadees can't eat seeds. So what, what Des thinks happened is that the parents simply ran out of caterpillars. They ran out of insects to feed these babies. Somebody had a feeder up, so they tried to feed them seeds, um, but the, the birds can't eat them, so they, so they die. There are real consequences to our, our plant choices. This is a quick summary of what, what Des has found in her three years of studying. When she compared landscapes dominated by introduced plants with landscapes dominated by native plants, the landscapes with introduced plants produced 75% fewer caterpillars they were 60% less likely to have a breeding chickadee at all. If a chickadee did breed in that landscape, it produced 1.5 fewer eggs. They were 29% less likely to survive. And the nest produced 1.2 fewer fledglings. And it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. Those numbers might seem small to you, but when you put it all together, it means that the birds breeding in these habitats are not reaching replacement rate. That dotted line is the number of young they have to produce to replace the adult population each year. Uh, and as soon as you get to 18, 17% non-native plants in the landscape, they dip below replacement rate. And that becomes a, uh, an ecological trap. We're drawing our birds into our non-native landscapes. They're trying to make it, uh, but they can't do it. Not sustainable. She also looks at the migrants that are moving through these, these properties. You know, migrants, of course, fly all night. And during the day, they are resting. People say they're resting. What they're really doing is eating. They're refueling. They've got to rebuild their energy so they can continue their flight. 51 species stopping in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. in Des's plots. And if they come down in the land of ginkgo, there's nothing to eat. So, you know, we don't have to wonder why we've got 432 species of birds that are in trouble now in North America. There's lots of reasons, but one of them is we're starving them by the way we landscape. You don't have to save biodiversity for a living, but please consider saving it where you live. Because if we only think about saving biodiversity in natural areas, we're going to lose. We don't have enough natural areas anymore. We have to do it where we live. We have moved plants and animals all over the planet. And we call the ecosystems that result novel ecosystems. And there are a number of ecologists excited about novel ecosystems. They say, oh, there's going to be great evolution uh, opportunities here. The definition of a novel ecosystem is one in which the organisms are just meeting each other for the first time in evolutionary history. The problem with novel ecosystems is that because they're just meeting each other, they don't have the specialized relationships that are nature. So you're losing of those specialized relationships. If you're waiting for monarchs to start eating corn or soybeans, it's not gonna happen. They're gonna disappear before that, that happens. So we have species disappearing from novel ecosystems. Uh, and if they're disappearing, we might wanna ask the question, how many species do we humans need? Let's be selfish about it. How many species do we act actually need? My answer to that question is we need all of them. 
We need all of them because it is the species, it's the plants and animals around us that are running the ecosystems that support us, producing those ecosystem services. We should call them biodiversity services and maybe people would appreciate a little bit more why we need biodiversity services. There of course was the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment way back in, in 2005. Hundreds of scientists from around the world measured the Earth's ability to support us and their very unhappy conclusion is that as of 2005, we had degraded the planet's ability to support humans by 60%. That's the ocean, by the way. That's not a recycling plant. That's the same as, same as taking planet Earth and shrinking it by 60%. At the same time, we keep increasing our population and increasing our, our economies. Anybody, almost anybody, can see that is not a sustainable relationship. Yeah, you get it. I know. What do we know? We turn the world into gone with the wind here. We thought that plants are just decorations and, and you know, so we have our, our big lawns. That's a lot of acreage. I don't know how many species used to be there, but it was thousands, I can guarantee you. Uh, and now they are, they are gone with the wind. So what we have to do is increase the size of the earth. We have to blow it up again by putting the plants back, by putting the right plants back. Uh, and I think we need to do it where we live, across the country. 80, East of the Mississippi, 85.6% of the land is privately owned. In Texas, it's 95% of the land. In the entire country, it is 83% of the land. In California, you got a lot of uh, public land. So it's only, I think, 43 or something percent of the land is privately owned. But let's start at home. If everybody made their home landscapes, living landscapes, we would make a huge change. But to do that, we have to raise the bar about what we're asking our landscapes to do. In the past, we've asked them to be pretty. We're good at that. Um, but now they also have to support life. If we don't support life where humans are, it's gone. We have to sequester carbon. I don't have to tell you people why we need to do that. It's plants that are going to help us do that. We have to manage our watersheds. It's plants that do that. We have to enrich our soil with carbon. You know, the soil scientists now tell us that carbon can, can hold seven times the total amount, or soils can hold seven times the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere right now. We just have to get it into the soil. Who's pumping it into the soil? It's our plants. And we have to support pollinators. It is now politically correct to support pollinators, or it was last year. <laughs> Why do we need to support pollinators? Well, many people will tell me because they, they pollinate a third of our crops. That is a reason, but I don't think it's the most important reason. They pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. Forget our crops. If we lost our pollinators, we would lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. Not an option. It is simply not an option. We're not talking about good land stewardship here. We're talking about essential land stewardship. We absolutely need our pollinators and these other, other animals. So there's a family that lives in this, this house on this property. If they're not generating all the ecosystem services they need, they've got to borrow them from someplace else. They're not going to borrow them from their neighbor because he's not making any. Um, they're probably not going to borrow them from their township's open space. If it looks like my township's open space, which is a huge lawn with a, a paved path around it and people walk in circles around it. We think if there's not a house on a piece of property, that's good land stewardship. Uh, but that is not good land stewardship. This is a house down the street from me. There are no food webs here. There's very little carbon sequestration. It's actively destroying the, the food web and there's no pollinators. This is not the way to go. I truly believe we're going to reach a stage where um, this is either culturally so unacceptable uh, that we actually, this guy would get fined for, for destroying the life around us. We've measured the amount of, of land that could be landscaped in um, Delaware, Northeast Maryland, Southeast Pennsylvania, 92% lawn. 92% lawn looks like that. Only 10% of the tree biomass that could be in these yards is there, and it's always these short-lived ornamental trees from, from Asia. That's no way to sequester carbon. And this is my neighbor's house with his 32 calorie pears. Every plant he's put on his 10 acres is a non-native plant. Now, why has he done that? Well, he, he doesn't know if it's native or not. He just goes to the nursery and does what everybody else does. He buys something that's pretty. <coughs> Plants are just decorations. Don't you know that? He's not considering the, the ecological roles these plants have to play, but we could get pretty plants that have food wet value, that are sequestering carbon, that are, are helping our pollinators, protecting our, our watershed. We just have to think more about what plants do ecologically. So let's talk quickly about how we do that. What does a biodiversity-friendly neighborhood look like? 
Um, this top bullet is the most important thing. We need to put enough plants back in between those isolated habitat fragments that are out there. So who's in between those habitat fragments? We are. That's where the plants have to go. They have to be these powerhouse plants that are going to support food webs and biodiversity. And if we put enough back, they will be connected. Those isolated fragments will be connected. They won't be isolated anymore, which means the populations within them won't be tiny anymore. So when they fluctuate, they won't disappear anymore. This is the most important thing we need to do to stop the steady drain of species from our, our uh, neighborhoods. Where are we going to put all, all these plants? Well, I suggest we put them in the area that's in lawn. We have 45.6 million acres of, of lawn in the US. Uh, and if we cut that in half, we could build a new national park that will be over 20 million acres in size. And we're going to do it at home, so we can call it Homegrown National Park. And it'll be bigger than, than the Adirondacks plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, my clicker's getting tired here, plus Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. You add up all of those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So let's do that. Let's take areas like this. This is the entrance to the Toledo Zoo, a very nice grass path filled with dandelions. And let's turn it into this. And when the zoo people did this, the board of directors had a fit. They said, nobody's going to come to the zoo anymore. <laughs> Changing culture is hard. Um, now, I took this picture right out in front of the hotel here. Here's, a, here's our whatever, whatever that is. Um, <laughs> It could be a, a setting like that. I took this at, at Susan's house the, the, the other night. Do you, I, you know, I was flying here looking at Science Magazine on the, on the plane, and this was a very handy statistic. You might want to copy it down. 265 million cubic meters of water are lost per day through evaporation from overwatering our lawns in Los Angeles. 265 million cubic meters of water. Could we use that water in a better way? I think so. I think so. Here's the, the, the new land ethic in agriculture. This is in Iowa. Weeds are gone, the, supporting the 4,000 species of native bees. It's all gone. It's now beautiful lawn. But it could look like this. This is also in Iowa. So people were recognizing this, how to, how to fix these things. This is a mulch sculpture <laughs> that proves you cannot use native plants formally, except nobody told the folks in, in Indianapolis this is an all-native planting in a formal setting. And of course, that's, that's an urban legend. Formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in Europe all the time in formal settings. And I guess it's OK because they're non-native plants over there. So it works. <laughs> this is a corporate uh, uh, landscape that invites the, the people to come out at noon to get sunburned. Could be a lovely setting like this. And they're really interesting research. Um, you probably know more about it than I do. But you spend 15 minutes in a setting like this. Your blood pressure goes down. Your stress hormone, your cortisol goes down. Your cancer is cured. You don't get divorced anymore. All kinds of wonderful <laughs> things happen. I say that because the, the research is showing that you get the same medical benefits you get from intense meditation, which has been shown to boost the immune system. It also restores our attention span. Our attention span is, is eroded. From the minute we, we wake up in the morning till we come home, we're all crabby and we yell at our spouse. But 15 minutes and you become a nice person again. Uh, so I'm going to put another ball up there. I'm going to call it mental health. Uh, or I could call it physical health. You put a, a tree outside of a hospital room and the patient gets better faster. You put a, a tree outside of a classroom and test scores go up. And people are scratching their head. Why is that? Apparently, it's the connection with stress. A little bit of nature lowers our stress and we do everything better at that point. Does that mean your yard has to be 100% native? No, it doesn't. There's room for compromise here. I always talk about crepe myrtle. Um, you guys use crepe myrtle here? Yeah, I bet so. You know, it's the perfect decoration. You can get it in any, any color. It's not too tall, has exfoliating bark. Uh, I think it's the only plant left in, in South Carolina at this point. What is its biological activity? Well, you know, it makes a few seeds and a few of the finches eat the seeds. But in terms of, of, of supporting caterpillars, really helping the food web, zero. So what's, you know, what's pretty but not very active? I always think of a, a statue. But how many statues do you want? You know, one or two will work, but, but we can overdo it. 
How do you know when you've succeeded? A thousand ways to measure that, but this is, this is the most important way. You gotta have holes in your leaves. This is holistic gardening. <laughs> That's a shingle oak in my yard. It shared part of its energy with a caterpillar which is now in the belly of a bird. I've got life in my yard because that tree was willing to do that. If you look at the plants in your yard and there's nothing eaten out of them, you're not sharing any of your energy. That's, that's a dead, dead landscape. But this is the best measure, those breeding birds. If you have birds breeding in your yard, you're doing lots of things right because they cannot do it unless they have enough to feed those, those young. So we can save nature, but only if we learn to live with it. And I'm gonna leave you with one uh, story about how easy that can be. Um, you may know this already, but this is the Atala butterfly in South Florida, where residential landscaping has accidentally saved this species from extinction. This is a little lysinid butterfly. It's beautiful as an adult. It's beautiful as a caterpillar, beautiful as a chrysalis, but it's an extreme host plant specialist. It's one species of plant in South Florida, the kunti, a native cycad. Well, kunti had a lot of starch in its roots, and the, the uh, Native Americans knew that, they used it as a source of starch. They taught the settlers when they came to Florida. A lot of starch and kunti roots. Well, around 1900, somebody said, let's start a starch industry using kunti. Um, so they did, in, in 1908 or something, 80% of the people who lived in Miami identified their occupation as starch gatherers. And they did, they gathered all the starch, they eliminated kunti from the wild. There were a few plants left in, in uh, gardens but of course, if you take away the only host plant for the butterfly, it disappears. Well, in 1973, we got the Endangered Species Act. There was a desperate attempt to find some Atalas around uh, South Florida. Nobody could find any, so they got it officially listed as extinct. They were hoping to get it listed as endangered so they could get some money from the government, but they couldn't find any. But about that time, somebody recognized Kunti as a valuable landscape plant. It's a low-growing evergreen shrub that does well in the sandy soils of South Florida, so they started to promote it. And now big plantings of Kunti, they're still in gardens, it's still extirpated from the wild, but there's enough Kunti there that look who showed up again. I used to say nobody knows where it came from, but somebody's claiming, oh, there was a remnant population on one of the keys and it's out colonizing. And it is, I was just in Florida, it's up past Vero Beach at this point, it's spreading throughout the state because people are planting Kunti. So what I love about this story is that it truly was an accident. They never got the Italo listed as an endangered species. They never got one dime of conservation money to save it. All they did was change the palette of plants used in common residential gardens by one. They added Kunti and the butterfly saved itself, which shows this is a really powerful form of, of conservation. If we can save this beautiful butterfly uh, by accident from extinction, think what we could do if we made conservation a conscious goal of landscaping. And I think it's gonna work uh, because nature has proven to be a lot more malleable, a lot more resilient and forgiving than I ever thought she would be. But I guarantee there's, there's a point at which she will not bounce back. We can't keep pushing nature for forever. But I do think she's gonna give us one more chance. <clears throat> and remember what the Donald says, make America native again. <laughs> Can you still hear me? Sit, sit down. I'm sure I talked too long, so we're wasting time here. What do we do now? Are we doing any questions or no? We're just, who's in charge here? <laughs> Somebody should eat the coffee and dangerous too because you paid a lot of money for it. Yes. Okay, is this message getting out to nursery owners and landscapers and landscape architects? Um, yes, it is. I've been talking about it for more than 10 years at this point. I, I, I talk to those people all the time and I can see a change. It, you know, it, it's slow, but um, nurserymen have figured out, uh, at least in the East they figured out, this is a business opportunity. 
Early on, one guy sat in the audience and said, you're trying to put me out of business. Uh, but then I figured, you know, there's 129 million homes in the U.S. If everybody re-landscapes, it's not going to put nurserymen out of business. And I'm talking about putting more plants in the landscape. So people are seeing that. Uh, so it's, it's a new industry. You know, these, these, we don't have the economy of scale for a lot of these native plants, but they're figuring it out. So I'm actually encouraged about that. Yes. Okay, what's the importance of congeners? So I assume you mean a, a non-native plant in the same genus. Um, we actually did an experiment with that. We had 18 pairs of congeners to see if uh, the native insects would be able to use the congener because it's in the same genus and presumably has similar leaf chemistry. Uh, well, uh, somewhat. It reduced insect use by 50% on average. If we talked about non-congeners, so plants that were not related, it reduced it by more than 75%. So uh, there is some advantage on average to being a congener, but um, you're, you're still losing. You're still losing. Uh, not, you know, that goes up and down. It turns out that non-native willows, actually there was no difference with non-native willows. Um, so there are a few exceptions, but, but by and large, why not stick with the native? Yes. Maintenance of native gardens. Notice I did not say they are maintenance free. I hear all the time, oh, natives are better than non-natives because uh, they're adapted and you don't have to take care of them. So a lot of people will plant a native, they never water it, and then they wonder why it dies. Think about the invasive species though, folks. They're, <laughs> they're really good at living and taking over everything. So that's, kind, that's not a, a strong argument. Any garden that's being established has to it requires maintenance. Sure, once you put the right plant in the right place and it's going, um, it's certainly less maintenance than, than a lawn. You don't have to water it uh, once it's established. Um, so there are advantages that way, but I don't, want it, I don't want to imply that this is, you can just not do anything and everything will be great. It still requires some gardening skills to keep these plants alive and get them going. Yes, one more. Well, um, yes, that is true. Moth, moth larvae more important for food webs and butterfly larvae, and you know why. First of all, there's no real difference between moths and butterflies. Butterflies in phylogenetically come right out in the middle of the moths. They really are just day-flying, bad-tasting moths. <laughs> the reason they're flying during the day is most of them don't taste very good, and that's why they're, they're not uh, very important. And also, there's so many more moths. There, for every butterfly species, there's 19 species of moths. So. I don't, it's not that I dislike butterflies, but it's going to happen with moths, and that's it. I'm out of here. So, I just want to let you guys know. For anybody that has more questions of Doug, um, Doug and Susan will both be available at lunchtime at the CMPS store to sign books, and you guys can con feel free to continue the conversation. Doug will also be here at our opening reception tonight. So, yes, thanks. Thanks so much, Doug. Thank you.